KCSU Stanford. This is the Henry George Program. Hello, I'm Mark Molino, and I'm joined by co-host Jacob Schwartz-Lucas, representing EarthSharing.org and the Robert Schalkenbach Foundation. This is a program dedicated to finding practical answers to the housing crisis, economic volatility, and environmental degradation here in the Bay Area and beyond. We compare and contrast the idea of the 19th century economist Henry George with that of both historical and contemporary thinkers. Also addressed are issues ranging from artificial intelligence, automation, and universal basic income to city planning and the land value tax, an idea popularized by George. Today, we talk to Supervisor Katie Tang. She is part of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors representing the Sunset. She has been there since 2013, and we talk about Home SF, legislation she has led and championed for the last two years, and which has just passed earlier this month. Welcome, Katie Tang. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. So, uh, Home SF, it's really, uh, this is an exciting piece of, uh, of uh, legislation you've been working on for uh, for two years. Uh, f- so, for folks who know nothing about Home SF, how would you describe it? Sure. I would say that it is San Francisco's plan to incentivize the development of potentially 5,000 permanently affordable units over the course of 20 years. And in combination of affordable and market rate, about 16,000 units over 20 years. Um, I think that without an incentive program, San Francisco will no longer be providing or will not provide uh, housing, affordable housing uh, for middle income families. And that is the goal of Home SF is to expand the, uh, the pie, if you will, of housing that is available to uh, people of different income levels because uh, from what we have seen, middle income families are the most rapidly declining population in San Francisco and we are really doing nothing about it. Yeah, one thing that makes it really exciting uh, from you know uh, some of our perspective is uh, I, I, I spend a lot of time in Palo Alto City Council, and every time you see upzoning happen, uh, you see people complain about developer profits, etc. And this is a nice thing because it it ties the the value in land value uh, when you upzone to uh, new percentages of affordable units, which is basically giving a lot of different people what they all want and. Uh, yeah, how how has this been received by people when you uh, when you first proposed this? Well, I would say that you know whenever you talk about upzoning or height increases, uh, there are folks in our communities that are very opposed to that, and um, you know whether it's blocked views or I just don't want any more heights in the neighborhood. I get that, and certainly when we first proposed the idea of home SF, especially in my neighborhood, which is mostly residential single family homes, I was met with a lot of lot of opposition. Um, however, you can't expect uh, us to be able to provide affordable housing without some sort of uh, funding or incentive uh, for developers. And so although developers get to benefit from two additional stories of height um, and density bonuses if they um, meet their 30% affordability requirement, you know, that that's all in exchange for um, us being able to, as a city, provide more affordable housing for middle income families because the city's current below market rate program only serves those that are somewhere around 65 to 55% of the area median income or below. And if you think about it, you know, even for, take for example, our teachers in San Francisco starting out salary, it's about $56,000 a year. That puts them at the 70% of the area median income in terms of their salary. So the, even our teachers are not qualifying for our low income, below market rate program. So we really have to re, you know, kind of shift the conversation. And it's not about, oh, we're trying to take away affordable housing from low income families. It's the fact that our, our salaries for certain um, job classifications are just not matching and keeping up with the pace of how much it now costs us to live in San Francisco. And so we need to do something about it. And I think home SF is one of those solutions. So uh, to uh, to sidetrack with, with teachers, because this is such a big problem right now, finding housing for our teachers, I'm not sure I personally understand. Uh, is, is it purely uh, finding a budget to pay the teachers, or is there other reasons that teachers' salaries can't catch up with uh, what housing costs have, have led to in SF? 
I think that it's a couple of things. I think um, a lot of the funding comes from the state, and there's a formula for it, right? And I think that whenever you do formulas, it's um, it, it, it inherently makes it uneven in certain parts of the state because San Francisco's uh, cost of living is just so much higher compared to, you know, say, other cities and counties. And so there's that factor. Um, there's a fact that maybe, you know, in our state budget, there's so many other competing priorities and funding for schools and teachers, um, you know, doesn't necessarily uh, get all the attention and the funding that it deserves. Um, and meanwhile, San Francisco tries so hard to, to backfill or to augment a lot of what the state doesn't provide. So it's it's a very complicated issue. I wish it was as simple as, okay, well, we want to just be able to fund teacher increases, which which we have tried to do. But it also means sometimes cutting in other places, which is which is not good within the school districts, even their own budget. Yeah, I I, 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 I think it has to do something with the court cases of, of forty years ago that basically moved all control of, of of school funding to the state level. But I I'm not positive that it is explicitly that. Uh, but yeah, it's certainly a difficult mm-hmm. situation you have up there, and it, I, I commend you for for right. finding innovative solutions because you're you're forced to. Uh, yeah. So as far as when it this has been, you've been working at Home SF for two years, and you finally brought it to a, to a, you know a overwhelming victory uh, just uh, just recently. Uh, why? Uh, I guess how did you bring it uh, from uh, to to getting everyone on board this way? Well, trying to get everyone on board for Home SF really took a team effort. You know, I think this was all um, really spearheaded by the planning department uh, in partnership with them. We were trying to figure out, well, how is it that we, you know, from a policy perspective, um, try to provide housing for middle-income families, but also meet requirements of state law to have a local density bonus program, right? Addressing the fears that people have about density and increased heights. And so what we did was, we just kept trying to share the facts with everyone. Um, we did adjust um, the legislation a bit over the years to make it, for example, stronger in terms of how it is that we uh, treat small businesses that may be impacted by construction. Uh, we made sure that not only are we providing um, housing for middle-income families, we also added an additional layer of affordability for low-income families. Um, so I think over the course of two years, we just did our very best to continue to listen to everyone, um, you know, and whatever their concerns were. So, for example, maybe it's that they want to make sure the unit sizes for the affordable units match the unit sizes of the market rate side. So, over time, we, we've locked on lots and lots of different amendments to, to, I think, get people in a comfortable position. But at the end of the day, the, the nuts and bolts of Home SF always stay the same. It's always that if you provide 30% affordable housing on site in a non RH1 or RH2 area, which means um, single family dwelling unit area or duplex. Um, So anything with three units or above, if you provide 30% affordable, then you get density increases and two additional stories above height limits. You must have at least 40% of your bedrooms be two bedrooms, and at least 10% of that must be three bedrooms. So those are the kind of the nuts and bolts of the program that never changed. It was all the sort of other issues that people raise around small business displacement or unit size or even bedroom mixes and even the the breaking out the income level so that we included more for uh, even our low income. Those are all things that we added up over the the last two years um, that I think makes Home SF just such a well-rounded, comprehensive program. So yeah, as far as uh, RH1 and RH2, that is uh, single-family uh, units, uh, is is there anything you think that SF could be trying better to, you know, I guess, make make gains for housing and still, you know, serve people who who enjoy what they experience in RH1 and RH2 units? Absolutely, and I think that the city has been, as you probably saw a couple of years ago, finally passed legislation to allow for the legalization of in-law units, uh, or, you know, as some people know, as granny units. And, um, you know, you talk about this 10, 20 years ago, that never would have been imaginable that a board of supervisors in San Francisco would have passed any sort of legislation. Now, granted, it was it's a voluntary program at this moment, but I think that there has been a lot of movement in the past year even, and will continue uh, to figure out how it is we can create more units within existing buildings. Um, 
I think that's really important because we're such a small city and county. We're 49 square miles, and we need to be really creative about um, protecting not only the character of the neighborhood, but also how do you augment the number of, of housing units that you provide. So we have to look at um, existing buildings, and, and that means also looking at single-family homes. So, uh, yeah, so Home SF, uh, the, the numbers that are set out in the next 20 years, Home SF is expected to deliver 16,000 new housing units, including 5,000 uh, permanently affordable units. I'm kind of curious, uh, what was the process to get these uh, numbers of what to expect? Sure. So uh, the program is, again, it's voluntary. And so it is um, the only restrictions are that it, you cannot use it on RH1 or RH2 areas. Um, you also cannot dem- demolish any rent controlled or existing um, residential units. So that took away a lot of parcels that were eligible for home SF right off the bat. So what we were left with were about over 200 parcels that we considered soft sites, meaning that about 30% or less of the site was actually developed to its full potential. So based on the over the analysis of over 200 parcels, um, that's how the planning department was able to um, estimate that over the course of 20 years, we would be able to provide about 5,000 permanently affordable units and 16,000 total units. Yeah, and I think that's such an important thing because uh, there, there's... I feel that people can very easily say, oh, it's growth versus displacement. And I think uh, with creative solutions like this, we can find ways to uh, not have displacement and still have growth. If you have new units, there's no reason that should be the case. Uh, Exactly, exactly. We specifically wrote from the very beginning of the legislation that there would be no displacement of existing tenants, residential tenants, even we went so strong that even if no one's living there, uh, it's, it's an empty rent controlled unit or something, you can't even demolish that and use Home SF. Now, keep in mind though that if you're a developer not using Home SF, you could actually go ahead and demolish that unit though. So, uh, I guess that's a question too. When you talk about you know displacement, is there you know I guess possibilities of of you can preserve n- displacement within your neighborhood? That is to say, you don't leave your neighborhood, but you know when you I guess if you're growing, you are going to see buildings change. But I guess you, how can we see buildings change without seeing neighborhoods change? That's that's a question for the future, I guess. I think so. And I think when we talk about the character of a neighborhood, it's really a snapshot in time and it changes, right? So if you talk about, let's just say the mission, for example, everyone's afraid of the changing character of the mission neighborhood. Right now, there's there's a big push to make sure that we're not um, displacing, you know, the historic kind of Latino culture that has been in the mission. But at one point, it was the Irish community there, right? And who knows what before that. So I think when we talk about neighborhood character and preservation of it, we have to keep in mind, what, what do we really mean by that? And for neighborhoods like the Sunset, which I represent, um, it's mostly comprised of single-family homes, a uh, lot of families and children and seniors. I think we look to, well, the buildings may change, they may get higher, we get may get more dense, but at the end of the day, for building units that allow more families to be here, aren't we preserving the fact that the, the nature of our district, which is a family-oriented neighborhood? So it, it just, I think we always have to clarify what we really mean by neighborhood characteristics. And when you talk about preservation, I think one thing you have to look at is preserving the affordability of the neighborhood. When uh, I guess your your family moved to the Sunset when you're young, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, and I, I guess when they moved, the affordability situation, as far as what it took to move there, uh, has changed a lot with what, how affordable it is today. And I, I I think that's one big thing we have to look about. You know, affordability. Uh, yeah, how how difficult is it right now to your you know family neighborhood? Uh, you know, to to move there today. It is really difficult to move into neighborhoods like even the Sunset, uh, which I grew up in. And when my family first moved to the Sunset, we were living in an in-law unit. I mean, it was still expensive for you know immigrants that just came from another country, but. Um, I think historically the sunset was not seen as a desirable neighborhood to live in, and that's why it was a little bit cheaper. Same with, you know, areas such as the Excelsior and so forth. But now you're seeing houses being overbid uh, in the sunset in these neighborhoods um, going well over a million dollars. I don't even know if I can buy a home here in the sunset district. That's how expensive it has become. And I think that 
that's why it's so important that we actually do encourage more development, especially in neighborhoods like the Sunset that hasn't seen growth for a very long time. We are at a housing imbalance in the Sunset. And so, for example, now with, I think, the momentum of Home SF and just the idea of, you know, our neighborhood even being remotely interested in development happening, we're actually seeing some projects come online I think that's really helpful because a lot of people want to stay here. They want to live by the beach. They want to, you know, live close to great schools. And a lot of, when there's no supply, new supply of housing, it really does force people to leave either the city or this district. So I think that the more you can bring online, yes, you'll have expensive homes, but at the same time, I don't think the status quo would work though, because again, we're, we're seeing people leave and um, there just isn't enough supply to go around for the demand. But I truly believe that there's still a lot of potential in even neighborhoods like ours where our transit and commercial corridors, you see a lot of buildings not built up even to existing height limits of about four, 40 feet. Um, a lot of them are one story, two story buildings. So we have a lot of potential. Um, and so that's why I think we still need to encourage housing through programs like Home SF. So you're working on what SF can do itself to make, you know, housing work. Uh, and I imagine you're also keeping tabs of how Sacramento is, is you know, making new uh, plans to, to basically coordinate and have all the different cities of the Bay Area work together. Uh, would you like to comment on how you think this may affect SF and the Bay Area in, in the future? It's very interesting to, to follow what's happening at the state regarding housing policies because, you know, San Francisco, we generally speaking, although we are very behind in terms of the meeting the demands for housing, we actually do quite a better job than some other municipalities that, you know, where the sort of the so-called NIMBYs have taken over, right? Not in my backyard. I don't want anything built. Um, but yet there's so much growth in terms of job and employment, which is a good thing. But if there's no housing that accompany it, then we're really shoving everyone into cities like San Francisco, right? So I think that overall, the state level, when you look at it from kind of a bird's eye view, I can see where state legislature, state legislators or even the governor want to put down policies to force all the different kinds of cities to, you know, build housing. So, for example, bypass some of the bureaucratic permitting processes so that you allow for housing to be built a lot quicker. And then you get a lot of pushback then from cities like San Francisco, uh, where we care a lot about process. We have residents who, you know, this is, this is everything to them, process, transparency, and so forth, being able to weigh in on projects. And so there is a little bit of that, that um, push and pull here where the state wants to really push cities, especially ones that are not like San Francisco, that are, that are not building anything. But at the same time, when it's such a broad, wide-sweeping policy, then it upsets people in cities like San Francisco where, you know, again, some of them w- would want more process and public input on, on affordable housing or just housing development in general. So in one additional way that I guess you talk about statewide issues affecting local housing, uh, we can look at, you know, people who ask, how are we going to afford to have these new populations come in? Uh, you know, where will the money come for the extra public uh, you know, utilities and infrastructure? And in California, we, we lost decades ago uh, the traditional way that we, we pay for that, which is basically uh, property taxes uh, at, when Prop 13. Uh, so with that kind of challenge, how can we square the circle of uh, how, without our, our traditional form of infrastructure, how San Francisco can grow sensibly? I think that that's why we've been pushing so hard to have development be built in conjunction along transit corridors, for example. We really want to encourage people to get out of their cars as much as possible, if they can, right? We're not saying everyone can do it, but to the extent that we are encouraging development, it should take place along um, our muni line, along you know a, a bus stop or so forth, right? Because then you can allow for the population to grow, but hopefully the congestion will not grow with it um, exponentially as well. And I think that um, the city, our city, just recently passed a new transportation demand management um, ordinance. Um, So it really forces developers to, before they're building something, to figure out how it is that they're going to help incentivize um, people, new people that move into their buildings to get out of their cars, to take transit, to ride bicycles, to do car you know, car sharing, um, 
to do uh, to maybe drive electric vehicles or so forth. So at least from the transportation perspective, we're trying to do a lot of that work up front before a developer even, you know, puts the first nail in the, the wall. Um, and and then in terms of other infrastructure needs, I mean, our city is growing. And so that means that um, there's been a lot of debate around, okay, do we have enough police officers to accommodate the growing population, right? So that's been something that we are looking at. Um, do we have enough schools? Right, we're building a lot in areas like Mission Bay, and there are barely any schools there. Do we have enough open space? Do we have enough childcare facilities? So, those are all the things that actually this board of supervisors right now um, we we are constantly um, exploring with the planning department and with other entities uh, because we do recognize that um, if we don't address head on, then we're just going to continue to have a growing population, but not the services that everyone needs. Uh, going along the lines of what Mark just asked about uh, property taxes and having enough to pay for the greater infrastructure as a result of more people being in the area, uh, property taxes can also play a role in encouraging development, uh, specifically if the taxes are on the land as opposed to the buildings, because uh, if you, say, own a vacant lot or own a derelict building or just any property that isn't being utilized to the uh, highest and best use or whatever the zoning uh, will allow, the the owner will want to uh, utilize it to bring in as much rent as possible and then, you know, keep whatever is left after paying a tax. So h- how do you understand this issue? Do you think that uh, maybe levying a tax on land higher than, say, buildings would be a good way to uh, incentivize a, you know, the the ultimate effect being a larger supply of, of housing and thus stabilizing rents. I think it, it could be a solution, but of course, there's always the sort of, well, it's a great idea, but is there the sort of political will or the community buy-in to allow something like that to even kind of pass and to be implemented? I actually think that one of the issues I've been seeing a lot of um, is that we have a lot of property owners actually um, throughout the city who are sitting on on either buildings or vacant lots um, or even buildings with no tenants, um, whether commercial or residential, and they have no incentive to do anything with it because, as you mentioned, you know, um, the state laws that have passed uh, in, you know, prior Um, And one of the things that has been difficult for us to do is to even engage in a conversation with property owners to say, hey, you've got this vacant lot sitting here for, I don't know, generations. Uh, Would you like to do something with it, you know? And um, and I get no response, you know. So I think that in some cases you do have to unfortunately have a stick to that. Um, do you need a levy, whether it's a fee or an additional tax, to make sure that um, people aren't just sitting on land? But then you'll also get another crowd of folks who will say, "Well, it's it's my property, it's my land. I could do anything I want with it. If I don't want to build or bring it to its highest best use, I, I have every right to not do that, you know." So. Um, it's the, the, the realities of it are very, very challenging. Yeah. Well, what do you think if you have, say, a vacant lot right in the center of town and there's trash and, you know, maybe people are doing illegal activities in that lot, uh, is this not somewhat of a, a social good that, uh, you know, if, if you own land, you have some sort of social responsibility to to use it well? Um, what are your thoughts on that? That's, I mean, I feel the same way uh, because I do have a lot, for example, that's very big on a transit and commercial corridor in my district. And I have had no success in contacting the property owner. And it has caused a little bit of a public nuisance because of all the trash that accumulates and so forth. Um, And I have neighbors who are so kind to even go and pick up trash um, around that lot um, on their own, right? So I think that, unfortunately, we do have to go through the public nuisance route um, and which is tough. It's not, I don't think it's enough of a stick to, to get a property owner to actually do something. But I mean, I agree with you, but again, to play devil's advocate, um, there are plenty of people who would say, well, I own this property. It's, it's the United States. I have the freedom to, you know, do what I want or not want with this property. So it's, it's, um, it, it's a very challenging dynamic here. It, it is. It always funny the people who do claim that kind of right, they don't really tend to, uh, 
you know, uh, disagree much with the idea of, of, of zoning when it serves serves them, even though that is uh, challenging what other property owners can do. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you never know. So, yeah. yeah. Some of them do care, some don't. Some don't even live in the city and, you know, again, sitting on property that maybe it passed down from generations. And it's just, it, it all comes down to the personality of that property owner. And, and that's what's very difficult. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing a lot of cities around the world uh, look at different ways to, I mean, you know, a, a tax on um, unused land or basically a land, you know, tax uh, is even being experimented with in, in London, which is, you know, you would have think I've heard of uh, a bit ago. Uh, so as as far as the future, what are you uh, what are you optimistic for after Home SF is, is I think, a, a great victory for working together uh, to look at new solutions? What what what's next uh, in, in your in your eye for the future? Well, now that Home SF has passed, um, we have been hearing um, about developers who have been actually very interested in using the program. And so I think that um, the team of folks from whether it's um, the various supervisors' offices, the planning department, our Office of Economic and Workforce Development, we are all trying to kind of circle around all those developers that are that have been waiting to build to um, figure out how it is that we can implement Home SF in the best way possible. So that's, that's really the next step. Um, trying to uh, educate folks about the program, what it actually is, um, making sure that people try to use Home SF versus, say, the state law, which I think does not come with as many protections um, that we offer through Home SF, such as no displacement of tenants and and strong protections for small businesses. So um, so that's, that's really implementation now. And, and then again, um, as I mentioned earlier, really trying to figure out how it is that we can continue to um, work within the confines of existing homes and buildings to to also create additional units in San Francisco. I, I'm just really impressed with, you know, I, I see so much zero-sum thinking of saying it's us versus them, and it just really depresses me. I'm really always inspired to see people who uh, look away from that and, and look for positive sums that we can we can all be- benefit from. So, uh, yeah, is there any, any f- final message for, uh, yeah, how we can all basically avoid zero-sum thinking in the future with housing? I... That is such a great point that really it is not a zero-sum game here. There are always ways to make it work for everyone. And I think that the most important thing is to listen to everyone's feedback and and really inter- you know process it and figure out, okay, well, what are they really concerned about? And then you know amend or work through your legislation or whatever program you're proposing uh, to incorporate and address those concerns. And I think that at the end of the day, you could get something like a home SF that, that really everyone truly was able to get behind with, you know, our 11-0 vote, our unanimous vote at the Board of Supervisors. So I think um, creativity is key, listening is key, and uh, persistence is key as well. And, and you certainly were persistent in the last uh, two years to make this happen. So uh, yeah, th- thanks. That's for, right. uh, thank you very much for being with us today. We're talking to uh, Supervisor Katie Tang of San Francisco. Uh, thanks very much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. So here's us just talking. This is uh, this is Mark here right now in conversation, and here's Jake on the other end. Hey, Jake. Howdy, howdy. Yeah, so uh, we've been talking in the first part of the program with uh, Katie Tang, supervisor for SF, and I think, yeah, we, we don't normally have a lot of time after the interview to talk about you know news from here and there, but, uh, yeah, it's very exciting to, to hear what's happening uh, around the world, S, uh, you know, SF. You know, no no real big changes, but it's really exciting to see an actual LVT proposal on the manifesto of both Labour and the Lib Dems in in uh, the UK these last couple of weeks. Yeah, and they did well despite that being on their manifesto. Well, um, you say despite. And, and I mean, it, it I wasn't think... as though that was hidden. It, it was it was well known that this was on their platform, and it didn't shake. It didn't seem to shake the uh, their constituents. So. Well, you could, I mean, call me an optimist, but I think you can say 100% of why uh, people love Jeremy Corbyn is because uh, they're all LVT nuts. Uh, no, it's it's funny to see, though, that this is the first time uh, you've seen, like, real people attacking LVT. It's, the common thing is, oh, that's kind of, uh, you, know, a, you know, a fringe thing that's, un, you know, politically infeasible. 
people that are Tories and whatever are actually attacking LVT, uh, calling it the garden tax. That's the right. that's the big slur over in the UK, which is if they're attacking you, you know they fear you. That's pretty cool. Right. And and I think that's one of the most mild, you know, pejorative things that you could say about LVT. Oh, it's a tax on gardens. Well, most people don't even have gardens. Yeah, and I think right. that's exactly. I mean, I think people try to make it relatable, but when you say I think I should have an, an untaxed garden and other people should struggle to live in the city, I think an average person is is kind of saying, "Wow, that's I th- maybe we should tax gardens." It's actually I think it's it's not really playing well to the moderates I've heard from. Right, and actually, you know, you could even make the case that it's not a tax on gardens at all. It's a tax on vacant, dirty, trash-filled lots without gardens. Um, so, you know, if there is a need for a for a garden, a, a need for perhaps a public space or even a private space to have uh, beautiful flowers and whatnot, um, then and that's the highest and best use, then then that's how people are going to uh, use it. And actually, you might even see more gardens as a result of a strong land value tax because all of those uh, underutilized and vacant lots will actually be beautified. Well, I mean, you look at places where you have something closer to a Georgist ideal, and it's not like you don't see uh, nice green spaces. Hong Kong has some of the most beautiful public uh, gardens I've I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it's if people say, "Oh, everything is brought to the best use," you'll only see buildings, never green spaces. Uh, that, that's really not true because green spaces certainly elevate uh, the, the the highest use of the land around it. Yeah, and if you think about the government having an incentive to bring in as much revenue as possible, then they're going to want to keep the parks and. Uh, you know, margins of the sidewalks and things like that, beautiful with lots of plant life. And because all of these things are going to increase land values. And I think for private developers, if they have to use every square inch of their space well, well, they're going to want to do things like, uh, you know, have gardens hanging off the side of the building on the roof. Um, I think it'd be great for gardens. And more, more importantly, for a lot of other things, it would reduce poverty, uh, more housing, um, more jobs. So, is it, how well do you understand? Uh, I guess the basic dichotomy of of British politics, because I'll say I I wouldn't consider myself very knowledgeable, but I think I'm trying to get the picture of how they all go out between. Like, basically, do you understand the difference between like Labour and Lib Dem and what they basically support? To some degree, but I would not call myself an expert. Yeah. I mean, it's if you were there, I kind of feel, if you think about what they try to represent, uh, Lib Dem sounds kind of like they're they're kind of more like the Matt Iglesias set. They're, you know, they're on the left, but they are more wonkish. Is that is that fair to say? Is that, because that's kind of the impression I get. You tell me. I have no idea. Yeah, I don't really. I mean, it sounds like they're kind of more of a you know left libertarian, whereas Labor is more about kind of uh, if you say the extreme end goes towards you know more kind of classic uh, you know socialist and, and Marxist. I mean, it's kind of crazy. They they've been going for moderate Blair type uh, folks, but now they have uh, in Corbyn a person who. He, one, he's familiar with uh, George and his policies, but he. Uh, is actually even uh, pushing to you know to the left of that, in insofar as kind of pushing more towards a, a Marxist direction, which I'd say kind of puts the LVT in a good place. When you have uh, in this last two weeks, we've we've seen a, the terrible disaster of the Grenfell Tower uh, over in London, uh, public housing which was not basically cared for and went up in flames. Uh, almost a hundred people died, and Corbyn pushed for basically as far as I understand, just requisitioning uh, private housing and to house people. And this has been enormously popular. Um, Well, it reminds me of the warehouse fire in Oakland uh, not that long ago. And, yeah, if you had something like a land value tax, all of these rundown structures would – they'd be torn down much faster and and a stable, safe structure would be put in their place. Well, I mean, you look in just in general, the overall concept of saying everybody deserves 
basically, you know, some some area of land for themselves, and you can make this happen uh, through through housing. And if you say that people are, you know, just have to take the scraps, they say you don't deserve the kind of protection that you know these other land landlords have, landowners. Uh, you have to, you know, basically squat in housing, which is just basically not safe for any person. Uh, it's this is just there's no reason we should be subjugating people to be living in in housing which is dangerous and we, we are seeing this happen because largely we have a tax scheme that uh just says they don't deserve uh anything and that's just i i think a, a bit abhorrent it's and, and people are dying yeah i mean the whole tax structure is such that if you uh if you're a renter you don't get any kind of mortgage interest deduction that a landowner would um if you sell your house and then buy a new one right away, you're you're given um, you're you're given that purchase uh, tax free. There's there's no such thing if you move as a renter. If your if your rent goes through the roof and you need to move further away from the center of the city, um, there's no uh, oh sorry for your hardship. Uh, let, let's cut you a tax break. The entire system is set up to benefit those that are already on the property ladder. And like you say, it's uh, forcing renters into desperate situations. And I call them, uh, you know, Harry Potter rooms under the stairs. Um, You know, for for people in their 20s that are living in big cities like New York, San Francisco, um, these can be very attractive options because even though they're exceedingly small, um, dirty, et cetera, they are a way for you to actually save up some money yourself so that what do you do? You can become a, a landowner yourself. And then for all those people that uh, you know didn't save up or weren't making surplus income, that they never get to get on that property ladder uh, despite working very hard. So th- that is fundamentally unjust. Yeah, you, you talk about, I, this relates to the idea of marginal land. When you say you're a person who has nothing to offer but just basically, you know, working hard, do what you can, you don't really have anything. You don't have, you know, basically, you look at in California, people get, you know, uh, real estate inherited from their parents at old tax rates. I mean, I think Prop 58, uh, which basically keeps old tax assessments to children, boy, that's that's something. But you talk about, okay, if you don't have any of that, you basically, can, you can get marginal land. Marginal land is land which is effectively valueless. And if you talk about some place that is just basically has expensive land everywhere, what does that mean? In the past, maybe you can get something that is still pretty good that's marginal, but now it means if it's a Bay Area, you're driving in from outside Tracy, you know, talking about just hours and hours of commute every day. Or if you want to be closer the marginal land is basically slums. It's places that no person should live, and uh, yeah, it's it's basically the scraps you're you're stuck with. And uh, if we, uh, in in what why do some people get that? It's so other people can basically accue uh, what is you know economic rent on land, which is. Uh, uh, you know, you'd say, well, people can make reasons to say, oh, this is the system. This is what people deserve, but it certainly doesn't you know, treat fairly everybody who, who can't really get on that ladder, as you said. Right. And, you know, if we're talking about uh, gentrification, you mentioned a moment ago, marginal land, you know, perhaps being defined as uh, land in the, in the inner city where there's currently slums, all of this desperation and lack of space leads to, you know, what we would think of as uh, hipsters moving into an area and, um, forcing all the rents up and and kicking people out but it's not all the hipsters and the artists that are causing the problem uh, they are a symptom of just the dearth of housing supply um, and when you have this incentive to not use your land well and to force everyone else out to the margins that is what is sowing the the seeds for this kind of interaction unfortunately uh People just see it as a as a racial issue, um, and it is a racial issue. But it's really the the underlying structure of it is this land problem. Um, and if we could get past that, then we could also clear this uh, the racial issue and the racial injustice. 
Well, you talk about, yeah, I guess the the perverse incentives of basically marginal land. The more marginal your land is, the safer you are and you can stay there, which is, you know, why you would see, you know, people have stability where traditionally uh, other people wouldn't want to move to because it is less valued land. Uh, you have stability there. And you are seeing in some neighborhoods, which have traditionally been, uh, you know, marginal, uh, you see people trying to keep it that way. They are actively trying to, like, paint over murals. They're trying to make it unattractive and unlivable in order to keep other people out. It, and we should not live in a world where your, your uh, incentives are to make your neighborhood worse. And perversely, that's what we're seeing. Right. If you think about it at its base, uh, you know, separate from the fact that the rent is going to rise, uh, gentrification, as opposed to displacement, should be seen as a good thing, right? Uh, you get a better police force, uh, better firefighters, uh, beautiful mur murals, parks, all of these things that we would want in our neighborhood, uh, yeah, this ought to be a good thing. And what is really stopping it from being a good thing is that the supply of housing doesn't adjust uh, in step with all of these improvements. And, well, why isn't the housing supply expanding in step with these improvements? Because of land speculation. I mean, to take a mile-high view of it, you talk about you live in a neighborhood that's okay and you're renting, and then suddenly it's getting, quote-unquote, better. Better being, you know, basically, you know, uh, you know, objectively valued by land values. It's getting more desirable, at least. And this should be a good thing. It's great things when everything's getting better around you. But in time, for so many people, you say, wow, it's getting better, but I'm not getting any of that. You know, I am I'm getting scraps and other people are seeing it get better. And could we big picture make it so when your neighborhood gets better, you benefit? And I think absolutely we should be aiming for a system that allows you to want your neighborhood to get better. And that's, you know, you know, a land value tax is one way this happens because it makes sure that the, the financing comes through the increases, which comes back to you. You could say either through, uh, you know, direct, you know, you could even help fund a UBI, for instance. That's one way. But just even if it makes your parks better, it could help you pay for your housing. You know, it's there should sure, be Sure, commute times to work. I mean, I, I live in New York City and. The trains here are rickety. They're old. They're always out of service, especially in the areas that are further from Manhattan. And there's no reason for this. If you go to Asia, they have beautiful trains. Some of them are maglev trains. They're extremely fast. If we had some of those kinds of trains here, uh, you know, you could get from one of the outer bur boroughs to Grand Central Station in 20 minutes. Uh, that would do wonders for productivity uh the the local government could you know have probably a surplus of revenue as a result of having such fast trains um but if you don't have a land value tax the the uh the windfalls or the rise in land values around these uh train stations are simply going to be siphoned off by those people that were lucky enough to own land around the stations beforehand so uh, you know, unfortunately, it's you have to plug this hole. This hole being, uh, whenever the government spends money on something that's actually going to improve people's lives, it can't just be allowed to leak to the lucky few. It's got to be um, recycled back into even greater improvements, or something like you say, a citizen's dividend, where people are seeing the results directly, you know, via check each month. And it's not to say, like, it's always just the 1%. We we talk about in America, a lot of wealth has been made for the middle class through real estate, and a lot of normal people have seen their housing values go up, uh, and that basically, this is a good thing to them. I mean, they, they, they feel, hey, guess what? You know, this is a nice break for me because my neighborhood got better. I can sell my house for more. I can refinance. I can, I can you know, benefit in so many ways. And the question is, you know, that's... Sure, we love to see people get nice breaks. The question is, why is it only for homeowners? And if you're a renter, why do you deserve none of this nice break too? And it could go to everybody if we just kind of uh, look at different ways of this. 
Yeah, and in, what we do instead is for the hardworking renters is we tax them when they work. We we put a wage tax on them. We put a sales tax on them. We put all these different taxes on them that are directly tied to how productive they're being. So, you know, some people could rationalize, uh, you know, getting getting this increased uh, property value because they worked hard and saved. And I'm not disputing that any of that is true, but uh, there it is not totally meritocratic and uh, you can you can make more money speculating in real estate than you can uh, being a doctor or a scientist um, and and that's a big problem the, the goal of our tax system should be to motivate people to contribute as much as possible and to, and to work as hard as possible and if you're actually punishing people for working and exchanging and participating in all these economic activities then you're you're going to have tend to have the effect of creating a system that is indeed less meritocratic yeah and i mean you you say like even if you don't put kind of you know saying like oh this was meant to help the upper classes you can say in america even if it was a real attempt to say we can all become rich by all becoming uh, landowners and homeowners and get homeowner wealth, I, we can see that fail. We have done everything we could in California for decades to protect homeowners. And what has been the result? Less people are homeowners. You can't basically pull ourselves from the bootstraps this way. It fails. This is a broken system. And what we see is just basically you know, a, a divide into the haves and haves nots. It's, it's, maybe you can say it wasn't disingenuous, but it certainly doesn't work. Well, it's precisely because as these property values are going up, it's also making rents go up. So Henry George talked about this as a wedge in society. Uh, it lifts people, certain people up to extraordinary wealth, and everyone under the wedge is crushed. Yeah. And I mean, we talk about, yeah, basically, what can we do when we see you know, land values get pushed back into uh, you know, local funding. Uh, and we talk, you know, Hong Kong does a great job with this. We talk about world-class subways uh, and also public housing. They have uh, just constant development in public housing, which does not happen to really any meaningful degree uh, in San Francisco. And uh, we talk about the UK. They don't see their land values go back in public housing. And we saw 100 people burned to death because they don't basically support their public housing with enough funding. Uh, and, you know, Hong Kong, you know, they, they aren't perfect, but they certainly uh, aren't at a lack of funds to put at public housing. No, they don't know what to do with all their surplus revenue. Yeah, and uh, and it helps when you have, you know, if you're in a city and you see all this, this you know, basically better parks, better transit around you, yeah, that's a way of giving it back to the people and not just basically private gains from people who sell their house and make a couple million dollars, which I, it's no, by no means are we targeting people who got lucky, but is this really the best system? Is it really funding the kind of society we want in our cities? And I think for most people, they would be hard-pressed to say, yeah, this works, because it doesn't. And it's not as though what you and I are saying is that we don't want to have rich people and, and poor people. I mean, I would like their to be a, a standard, a floor by which it's uh, impossible to, to go below just because I don't want there to be a lot of human suffering. But it, it's not as though we are saying that everyone should be absolutely equal. We're not saying that at all. We're just saying that if you're richer, it's because you earn it. There are not these uh, interesting loopholes in our system that allow you to get ahead um, merely by gaming the system. Uh, you should get ahead because the uh, social value you create is higher than those around you. I mean, I, th I think a corollary of that, it's really tough to earn an honest billion dollars. Like, what does that mean usually to just basically say, oh, yeah, I, you know, worked hard, made the right decisions, and I, you know, earned a billion dollars? It's usually you see in all time for every person who makes a billion dollars, there's a lot of people who basically work harder and have to pay them money uh, for the billion they make. You talk about, uh, you know, you know, all the landlords, people who who made billions of dollars by buying up the orchards of of the Bay Area. That really means that for decades, people 
you know, directly and indirectly were putting money in their pockets. They make, you know, billions of dollars. They could have had cheaper rents instead. And there's no really such thing as just uh, saying that when you make a billion, it, it doesn't really come from other people, uh, you know, most of the time. It's very hard to say you earned it through honest wages. Right. And actually, all of the entrepreneurs that are just getting started, they don't have a lot of capital at the moment, but uh, they have a good idea. They, you know, they are very likely to be successful um, and they want to roll out their idea as quickly as, as quickly as possible and start hiring people. When you have artificially high rent as a result of there being a restriction in the supply, then this actually slows down. Uh, business activity, and and so you know if if you want to give a push to all of the folks that are innovating and ultimately quote unquote creating jobs, then you have to deal with the fact that the the biggest payment that any entrepreneur will make is for uh, just just access to space, especially well located land where they are going to um, be near workers where they're going to have inputs to whatever product or service they're creating. And again, if, if uh, the price to access land is high, then this is going to be a drag on economic activity. Yeah, here's, a, here's a story I just heard in uh, Menlo Park up the street from, from uh, Stanford campus is uh, a person was running a restaurant, and because he was having like so much trouble paying you know, enough people to commute in and work for him, he is paying for their, you know, basically their living. He's paying for their rent in apartments nearby. I don't know exactly what he's doing to basically afford all this. Uh, but the thing is, if you're running a restaurant, it really shouldn't be at your bottom line to pay for people's rent. People should be able to basically be able to, to have rent and not pay a fortune for it. Uh, and if you think about it, it's, you know, every time you, you're buying stuff for the restaurant, it's more expensive because you're paying for employees' rent that's going to go to landlords. So, I mean, it, that's basically where it all flows down to. No matter what you're paying, that's where the expense goes. And let's look at uh, getting loans to start small businesses, right? If you already own land, you can use the land as collateral for a loan. The banks aren't in the business of determining whether you have a good business idea, whether you're likely to be profitable and to pay back the bank. All the bank cares about is whether it can capture the property back if you do not if you do not actually pay off your loan. So what it, this is implicitly sending out into the market as a signal is that. Uh, in other words, your uh, your business idea doesn't matter. The likelihood with which you'll be successful doesn't matter. So it's not awarding loans to people who will uh, likely start a successful business. It's awarding loans to a subset of people who uh, already have land that um, are also likely to start a successful business. You see how those two things are very different, and it makes the American dream unattainable for those that uh, aren't already on the property ladder. But yeah, so as far as like just kind of people on the on the right not really understanding a whole lot, uh, there is one extremely bad take everybody's talking about this week about the Grenfell Tower uh, fire. Uh, Megan McArdle, are you familiar with her? No, I'm not. Uh, she She's written for a bunch of things. She's kind of a weird contrarian uh, libertarian uh, type. She writes for Atlantic now, or Bloomberg now, excuse me. She was Atlantic in the past. But she wrote of just basically, oh, don't go too quick to blame, uh, you know, uh, the Grenfell Tower on not enough, you know, prices, because if you, if they spent more, then housing would be more expensive everywhere else. You know, it's, uh, it just, it's, yeah, I don't know. And it it just seems like so many people don't really understand what really makes a housing market work. Because uh, her basic argument was that higher construction costs will make housing more expensive for most of us. And, you know, sorry to, to break it to people, it's not construction costs which are really the main thing you're paying for. Uh, so much of the time it's pre-existing real estate and rising land values. And, yeah, that's that's just really not this whole kind of perfect, ideal, libertarian, uh, everyone just kind of is able to build uh, when you just ignore the cost of, of land, because that's just not how, how housing markets work. Yeah, think about every other material item in the economy. Um, as technology improves, all of these things get 
less expensive. So we've been making bricks as a species for a very, very long time. Uh, the price to produce bricks has gone down a lot. So it's not as though the bricks and the mortar are going up in value and, and making housing more expensive. It's literally the, the location in which you put the bricks and the mortar. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like it's, that's the question of just, I feel there are yeah, people on the right who have a mixture of not really having a heart and not really understanding things and having much of an econ 101 perspective. And then there's kind of, I guess, the danger of, of you know, thinking on the left, which I think ignores any kind of economic thinking at all. And, uh, I mean, you see the danger of just kind of, you know, dogmatic Marxism, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's just, I, I feel like there's kind of a news break that turned into kind of, you know, econ theory talk uh but yeah i mean i think it's it's important to kind of say hey look what happens hey let's talk economics because you know no matter how we live our lives it 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 factors in what do you think we could do to get regular people to have a better understanding of some of these fundamental concepts that would remove uh, a lot of the misunderstanding that that just leads to these erroneous conclusions and allows people to you know think that you know the problem is all of the materials that go into housing or um you know just endorse solutions that don't make a lot of sense if you understand some basic things about economics i mean i i i'm i'm kind of pessimistic i think most people don't really have the you know time inclination you know effort or i mean it's 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 can be dry, boring stuff, and I think you know most people when they talk about what they want out of you know, out of politics, they want to uh, they want to kind of go out and say, uh, you know, we want to basically be fighting for the right side. We want to be on the you know basically for the good guys, and it's mostly kind of you know they want to be on the right side of culture usually, and it's very dry to say, hey, let's talk about you know wonkish correctness, and and it's that's it doesn't get people excited, and when people say you know, this is kind of, uh, you know, uninspiring, but kind of blandly correct. Yeah, it's not going to get people, you know, really reared up. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think in what I worry about is in practice, you tend to see the economics uh, be basically a class of wizards that support whatever side says, hey, the economics say this is correct. You look at like California, uh, and you'll have the you know economics be used to justify. Uh, like Contra Costans, uh, Costa Costans, Costa Hawkins, excuse me, uh, the, the the state law basically ending uh, any future rent control uh, past a certain year. And from a certain perspective, you can make an economic argument that, uh, yeah, it's, it's economically uh, inefficient to have rent control. But guess what? We have a lot of other things that are economically inefficient which aren't getting pushed by the same ideological spectrum, and therefore they're ignored. So I think if you pick and choose correct economics by whatever flatters your ideology, uh, and most people just kind of say, well, let's just ignore economics, I mean, you can't blame them. Economics, like statistics, unless you really look at it, can lie to say whatever you want it to say. Um, and it's unfortunate. Well, I think it was Hume that said that logic was a slave of the passions, right? You don't reason anything that isn't already deeply embedded in your emotional system. Um it's just that I think if a lot of people understood the landscape differently, their idea of what was good and what was bad would change. Um, good and bad is meaningless unless you have context. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 and I guess the idea is if you talk about it's the controversy, where do you go on it? Yeah, you're going to have people break down over cultural lines, over kind of their own internal passions. I think if you talk about better systems of land tenure and land use coming to, to a, an idea, it just has to be common sense. And right now, uh, we're seeing a lot of people, you know, kind of say, hey, we both have a lot of good points here because we don't really see the synthesis of everything saying, hey, here's the common sense solution we can have uh, to basically you know, have us, we don't fight so much. And, uh, I think we're slowly, slowly, slowly inching towards the common sense. I mean, you look at, you know, ideas in the past that were considered crazy, uh, are now common sense to take an extreme example. You know, slavery was seen like as, 
well, you can't change that. You know, it's just not in the in the thing. But I, it's now common sense to everybody. Yeah, you know, it's insane to enslave someone else. Uh, and I think if you look at land tenure, which basically perpetuates pro- poverty, right now it sounds like, well, you can't change that. But in the future, maybe, maybe, maybe it can just be common sense and say, boy, you know, why didn't we have a land tenure scheme which doesn't promote, uh, you know, basically an accrual to landowner class over everyone else? It's It really is. It doesn't really benefit anybody. And if you look at the idea of just saying, uh, you know, of land ownership and private profits uh, coming from it, it doesn't really jive with common sense, but I do agree it takes a lot kind of more uh, thinking to get to the point that it's common sense. This has been the Henry George Program. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the producers and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of KZSU, Stanford University, etc., etc. Previous episodes can be found online at seethecat.org. This is a presentation of KZSU Stanford. Stanford.